um, the role of social and sexual networks in population health. And apologies in advance that because I am an infectious disease epidemiologist, a lot of this is infectious disease focused, but there'll be a big chunk in the middle that's kind of generally information about networks that I think hopefully will be um, helpful to folks regardless of their, their area of concentration. And see if I can progress my slides. Okay. Um, so broadly what we're gonna talk, what I'll talk about is first, why do we care about networks and population health? Then move on to um, network driven sampling and uh, a little bit about data collection tools for network data. Then talk about some general kind of network terminology and measures. And then finally talk about a little bit of my work, a couple of kind of different projects thinking about networks and HIV. So networks play a key role in our understanding of population health more broadly. Um, and within the area of infectious disease, infectious disease transmission generally can be conceptualized as occurring through networks. And networks can take um, many forms. So it can be between people, it can be between animals, between places or between uh, kind of a mix of those things. So people and places and et cetera. Um, and those contacts between people can be, um, uh, take different forms. So it can be a social contact, it could be a sexual contact, drug use, et cetera. So it really depends on uh, your disease of interest and, and what your question is, what type of network you care about. Um, so jumping immediately to infectious disease, um, within disease spread and networks on the on the left, we have um, kind of just a very basic conceptualization of the, the role of herd immunity in the spread of, of a disease on a network where on the on the left you have a fully susceptible population where one one infected individual is introduced to your network. And on the right you have um, a fair number of existing um, immune immune individuals. And so you see that the disease spread is uh, across the network is much more rapid and widespread on the on the left than on the right column. Um, and then on the right is just kind of a visualization of what that disease spread looks like on a dynamic network as we move forward in time, where we go from having when we start the little simulation, there's the kind of uh, an individually infected node in red, and then we slowly see that they sp spread across those those individuals as they connect with their uh, different ties. And um, thinking about um, sexual networks and STIs, um, this is just a, a really kind of pivotal study in, historically that was conducted in the 1990s in, in uh, Colorado Springs. Um, on the left, we have um, a sexual network, the largest component within a sexual network that they collected data on. And on the right is showing um, the uh, that that component with uh, disease status. So uh, if you have a, a G, that, that person had gonorrhea, a GT, both gonorrhea and chlamydia, and just a T, uh, chlamydia. And you can see um, that within this highly connected component, but there's tons and tons of disease. And I think that it's it's 248 of those 300 individuals um, had an STI. So you can see when you have densely connected networks, disease spread is quite rapid. Um, another way that um, uh, networks are really useful in um, uh, infectious diseases and mathematical models of disease transmission. So. Um, mathematical and, and simulation models rely on network data to be able to characterize modeled contact patterns. Um, so within respiratory diseases, uh, you want to know the characteristics of who people interact with. Um, and the polymod data has been widely used to characterize these social network pattern, social contact patterns. Um, and this, this plot on the right is just showing um, that polymod data, just a, a mixing matrix showing um, that when you see the the kind of white colors, there's there's high density of contacts between those ages, um, and when you see the blue colors, it's really low density. You can see this along the diagonal. There's this strong level of of mixing um, where people are people are 
likely to interact with folks who are um, the same age as them. But then you also see these bands on kind of the one generation removed uh, lower and higher where people are interacting, for instance, with their kids or their parents. And um, I think that this data has been, I mean, so <laughs> very widely used, particularly um, as, as we've um, uh, experienced COVID over the past couple of years. Um, and so next I'll move on to talking a little bit about um, both network-driven sampling. So how can we use a network to um, come up with our sample? And then a little bit about some data collection tools. So I want to collect data about a network. How do I do that? Um, and just to give you a, a, an overview of what types of network data there are, um, the first is, is sociocentric or sociometric data. Um, and I will note that there are a lot of times in, in these slides that I have put this little equal sign because people use the same words for, or people use different terms for the same concept and um, it's kind of field dependent. And I'm sure that I there are many that I haven't even listed, but trying to put this, I think that's one of the, the most intimidating things that you start thinking about networks is that there are so many words and the, the, the terminology just isn't unified across concentrations. Um, so anyway, about this sociocentric network, this would be complete network data. And it would be basically you conduct, conduct a census of your population and you have to put some bounds on where that population ends. Um, and then you have individuals identify people that they're tied to with whatever type of tie it is, whether it's a social contact or a sexual contact, et cetera from that census listing. Um, and so um, that is kind of the ideal is to have that sociocentric data. But aside from a few um, really exciting studies that have kind of collected sociocentric data, a lot of the time we don't have that when we're talking about people and their, and their uh, ties with, within a social or a sexual or a, or a drug use network. Um, the type of data that's much more easy to come by um, is egocentric data which is partial network data. Basically you sample individuals and you ask them about the characteristics of their most recent ties. Um, so within, for instance, sexual network data, we would ask people about, for instance, their three most recent partners, four most recent partners, et cetera. And so we would have information about the individual and their partners, but we wouldn't have information about how those partners connect to other individuals within the network. Um, but what's great is that you can use this egocentric data um, to both answer questions about, um, for instance, mixing patterns. So you can see um, how alike people are with the people that they're tied to. But you can also see um, potentially generate um, complete networks from this uh, this information within the egocentric data. Um, so thinking about how we can use a network to um, sample a population. So um, this is really commonly used in HIV, but in a lot of other fields as well. Um, so within, particularly when you ha have a hard to reach population, that's your population of interest, utilizing a network could help us to sample that population of interest. Um, so particularly stigmatized populations. So depending on what setting you're in, this might be women who sell sex, people who inject drugs, social minorities, um, and they likely will not participate in or respond to or disclose participation in that stigmatized activity when they're involved in research that targets the general population. Um, another point is that it's likely not possible to generate a sampling frame for these hard to reach populations, um, whereas you can kind of get a, a sampling frame for the general population generally. Um, so social sexual or drug use networks can help us to reach those hard to reach populations. Um, and some of the network driven sampling methods that are most common are either snowball sampling or respondent driven sampling. So snow snowball sampling is basically where study participants recruit other participants from among their contacts. So their social contacts, their sexual contacts, drug use contacts based on interactions of interest. Um, there's no limit to the number of contexts that that a participant recruits. And this is really a non-probability sampling technique because you're just uh, sampling folks and then uh, just 
just recruiting folks and then inviting them to to bring their um, their network members in. Um, so it is one way to get a sample, um, but it's not going to get you to kind of like an unbiased estimate necessarily. Um, uh, then there's respondent driven sampling, which is I think the um, approach that's kind of a, a shinier approach, but um, it allows for you to uh, uh, get asymptotically unbiased population estimates. But there's a big caveat there, which is that if the assumptions of, of RDS hold, and I'll talk a little bit about that on the next slide. But so basically what you happen what happens here with a respondent driven sample is you start with a convenient sample of seeds from your population of interest. Um, you provide a set number of coupons for each of your seeds um, and your subsequent participants to pass to members of their network in the target population. And this allows your contacts to remain anonymous. Like, so I'm not going to have to tell someone about all of my, my, um, my network members and, and have the study participant or sorry, have the study staff go and go and contact those people, though I can just contact them directly. Um, everyone who brings in a, their coupon is asked to participate and uh, the participant also needs to report how many contacts they have in that target population. So this is called their degree. Um, and there are incentives for participating in the interview and for recruiting peers. So you have both the kind of actual interview is where you get an incentive. And then also when your peers come in, that's when you get another incentive. Um, and the more waves that you get through, so the more kind of levels through the network, there's the less dependence on your initial convenience sample. Um, so for instance, in this schematic, this is the results of um, five, different, or, yeah, five different seeds going through the network. And you can see that seed three was really successful in getting deeply into their, their network, whereas seed six was not very successful. Um, and so what, what you ideally want when you do an RDS sample is for everyone to look like seed three. Um, and that gets to that last point about having less dependence on your initial convenience sample. And there's a lot of thought about kind of choosing highly connected folks for those, 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 that convenience sample to, to get deeper into the network if possible. Um, so the assumptions of, of respondent-driven sampling are that one, your network is large relative to uh, uh, the sample size. Two is that uh, the target population network is a connected graph. So you have to have basically all of your, um, all of your target population has to be like reachable through, through ties, which I think is questionable whether, whether that's the case in some, some of the time. Um, the network connections also need to be reciprocated. Um, so for instance, if I think that within my tw my network of 20 friends, I, that all 20 friends would also think that I was their friend. Um, recruitment within a participant social network is at random. So if I'm again have those 20 friends that I would I would choose one from those to give my coupons to at random. Um, which also probably sometimes is an assumption that's violated. Um, the sample is selected with replacement. Uh, respondents accurately report their degree. Um, so I'd have to know that I have those 20 friends and that, would, that have that number known. Um, and then there's kind of question about what sufficient number of waves. So when you get how deep in the into the number of, of levels of recruitment, do you need to go for it to be considered sufficient? Um, so as you can see, all these assumptions are, um, some of them are more justifiable than others. And, and so um, I think there's the, a lot of work around this topic and, and whether it's, whether you can kind of get to this um, goal of having this asymptotically unbiased estimate or not. Um, so then just talking more broadly about if I want to collect network data, so I want to sample a population and then ask them about their networks. Um, and this is really particularly within the context of egocentric uh, data collection. Um, the kind of traditional way that you collect this data, so this is for instance, um, within the, the demographic and health surveys, you go through a set of many, many questions. So this is only five, but there might be you know 25 questions about each of your most recent for this 
this is within sexual partnerships. So three most recent sexual partners. If it was a social network, it would be three most recent or three friends or something, whatever, whatever the, the, the tie type is. Um, this can be pretty onerous and, and sometimes leads to folks um, being less inclined to, to report all of their um, partners because it's just time consuming and, and kind of network data has had this kind of reputation for, for just being hard to do. Um, so uh, the team that I work with at, at Northwestern um, has uh, developed this tool called Network Canvas that's a, a free and open source software that you can use to collect data on personal networks. Um, it provides a user and interviewer friendly interface for egocentric data collection. So as you can see, um, they're kind of populating the people that are within their networks and then drawing the ties between people. Um, and this is all kind of very visual and, and uh, Kind of understandable for for participants and has been used in a lot of a lot of research studies. Um, it also includes like you can have different types of ties, for instance, and um, a, a range of of kind of different uh, network data. This is just one of the types of of, of network data collection that that you can uh, collect. But you can also um, collect information about individual. Um, uh, alters or ties. Um, for instance, here you would, instead of having kind of that list of many, many questions, you'd drop each of your, um, each of your contacts within um, a very, a different set of categories. And some of the time this can, this can streamline some of the onerousness of the, the network data collection. So I think that it's a, an exciting tool to, to be able to use. Um, <laughs> Uh, next, I'll move on to um, network terminology um, and measures kind of broadly. So I apologize for folks who are familiar already with networks. This might get um, uh, repetitive, but this is just to, to give a little bit of familiarity around these terms. Um, uh, a network uh, can also be called a graph. So that would be all of these um, these little circles are are different let's say these are different people and they're tied together by by friendships um the nodes on a net in a network can also be called our vertex or actors and they're for in the, our example here are people and then the ties are the or the edges or the links are um kind of what connects those people so the the friendship between person four and five here um, there are also a, a number of other ways that you can classify networks. So networks can be um, bipartite or not. So if they're not bipartite, there are basically no rules about who can be tied to one another. Uh, in a bipartite network, uh, there are kind of two types of individuals or, or entities, whatever they are. And then there can't be ties between um, for instance, here the blue, the blue nodes and the blue to blue and red to red can't have ties, but all the ties have to be between the blue and the red nodes. So an example of this would be a like a purely heterosexual network, or for instance, if you were to tie people to places, and, and so the people were the red dots and the places were the blue dots. Um, networks can also be directed or undirected. So for instance, a directed tie would be like a friendship where I could report a friendship with, with person X, but person X might not report a friendship with me. Um, and, or it could be undirected. So a sexual network is generally considered undirected because the, if two people had, had sex, that's kind of non-directional. Um, uh, you can also look at whether it's weighted or unweighted. So if it's weighted, there's some numeric value of the tie. So for instance, if it's a stronger tie, it'll have a higher weight than a lower lower number tie. Um, and ties can also be unweighted. And then it's just a zero, one, yes, no, there is a tie or there isn't. Um, network can also be either static, so they don't change over time, or dynamic, where they do change over time. Um, so, some of the key things to know with, when you have network data 
our um, first degree. So this is the number of uh, neighbors for each node in a network. So your degree distribution is gonna show the probability that a node has K neighbors. Um, so some of the important measures are your mean of that degree distribution, so your average number of neighbors, and the variance of that degree distribution, which just shows the variability in degree. And particularly this is important for epidemic dynamics. Um, I don't think I, I think I cut the, the section explaining that in more detail, but um, for, for those interested. Um, and so the, um, uh, if we were to take this teeny little network that we have, we would be able to go, for instance, node one has degree three, um, and we could uh, calculate our, our mean degree and our the variance of our of our degree distribution. Um, the next concept is components. So these are measures of connectedness. So components are subsets of the network that are all connected and tells us how many people can be reached, for instance, in infectious disease epidemiology by an infection. Um, so we have one, two, three components in this little uh, dummy network. We can also think about shortest path length. So this is a measure of the distance between nodes. Um, it's the minimum number of ties that you need to step through to get from one individual on uh, a network to another individual on a network. Um, and diameter is the maximum shortest path length um, within, a, within a network. Um, so if we wanted to get to, from person A to person B, we'd step through four ties and that would be our, our, um, our shortest path length before between A and B. Um, next is uh, centrality. So centrality measures for any given node on the network, how important is that node? Um, and there are different ways to measure it. So it could be, you could use degree centrality. That's basically just using, using the degree that I described. So how many ties does someone have? Um, you can use betweenness, closeness, and there are many more measures, but I'll talk really quickly through betweenness and, and closeness. Um, betweenness is just the number of shortest paths that an individual lies along. So for instance, in this little network, person two is going to have higher betweenness than person five. Person five is way on the end and isn't going to be along any of the shortest paths on the network. You can also look at closeness, which is the mean um, distance between a node and all other nodes that can be reached from it. And there are different ways to calculate it, but the simplest is to do one over the sum of the shortest paths. Um, and with all of these measures, um, you, the, the, there are lots of great software packages that can, you can use to, to calculate these measures for you because they're, they get pretty complicated. They're okay to calculate kind of by hand in, in a five person network, but obviously get very complicated fast um, as your network gets bigger. Um, mixing patterns, um, just generally speaking, alter disease dynamics. So they can alter how many people will be reached by an epidemic and how fast people are infected at the start of the epidemic. Um, and assortativity, which is also sometimes called homophily, is mixing with others who are like yourself. And so this is an example of a friendship network from, um, I think, a high school um, or maybe it's middle, yeah, sorry, it's middle on the top and, and high school on the bottom. Um, and the nodes are colored by by race, ethnicity. And so you can see, I think the yellow is is white, not white, non Hispanic folks, and, and the green nodes are, are black, non Hispanic folks, and red is uh, other race, ethnicities. And you have very clear um, uh, assortativity here where you see. Um, uh, racial patterns of, of, of friendships within this, this school network. Um, so now I'll talk about two um, a little bit disparate projects um, that I've worked on um, looking at networks in HIV. Um, and the first is using a, a bipartite networks to examine racial and ethnic differences in mobile app used. Um, for sex dating and relationships among uh, young men with sex men and young transgender women in Chicago. So 
apologies that I, this is a big gear shift. So this is, this is very much applied work now that whereas that has really been uh, more conceptual. Um, so just some background is that um, online and dating and hookup apps are um, increasingly common way that uh, sexual gender minority youth and young adults meet their sexual partners. I don't need to tell you that. Everyone knows that. <laughs> um, however, the experiences of, of SGM folks on uh, hookup and dating apps vary substantially by race, ethnicity. So um, uh, folks of uh, who are uh, racial and ethnic minorities are frequently experienced racialized stereotypes and with multiple um, uh, marginalized identities experience intersectional stigma um, and <laughs> racial and ethnic differences in hookup and app use could potentially lead to differences in sexual network structure um, particularly racial homophily um, so this could potentially impact uh, sexually transmitted infection transmission uh, within networks of, of uh, young men who have sex with them so we use uh, bipartite networks to assess differences by race, ethnicity, and HIV status and app use uh, in a diverse sample of uh, young men who have sex with men and transgender women in Chicago. Um, so the data are from the, the radar cohort, which is um, young men who have sex with men and transgender women. So uh, 16 to 29 at uh, recruitment um, and identify as gay or bisexual report sex with a man in the prior year. Um, you need to be English speaking and, and able to attend study visits in Chicago. Um, and then we use also data from the plot me sub study of the radar study, um, which basically what we're pulling out of the, lots of data collected, but specifically we're looking at which apps an individual used to meet partners um, using a name generator for in the last six months, what websites or mobile apps did you use to meet people for sex dating or relationships? And this data was collected using the Network Canvas tool that I talked about uh, earlier in this talk. Um, I think I tried to combine that slide. Um, so the analysis that we use, um, first we present some descriptive statistics. Um, the Just as a note, race ethnicity is grouped into four four bins, so Black non-Hispanic folks, White non-Hispanic, uh, Latinx folks, and other non-Hispanic. Um, and we first generate a bipartite network. So remember, bipartite means that uh, there can be tie, there can be ties between type, but not within type. Um, so our ties are between apps and participants. And we present summary statistics for one-mode projections. So one-mode projections are basically where we create um, a uh, participant participant network, or here I use the word egos, ego ego network, and an app app network, and the ties between egos are the apps that connect those individuals, and the ties between apps are the the egos that report using that those same apps. Um, and I only present the the ego projection for for now. Um, and then we calculate assortativity coefficients. So this is basically just like very similar to like a Pearson co co coefficient for look, Pearson correlation coefficient for uh, people on the one mode production on race ethnicity. Um, just some quick descriptives. Um, there are clear differences in app use by race ethnicity of participants. Um, and those circles are not great, but um, basically you can see that that white and Hispanic folks are much more likely to use Grindr, Tinder, and Scruff than other race ethnicities, particularly black non-Hispanic folks. And black non-Hispanic folks are much more likely to use um, Jacked, Plenty of Fish, Facebook, and Snapchat um, than other race ethnicity folks. And so, one second there. So here is our bipartite network. So the size of the app name is um, based on how many folks report that app. Um, and then the, the uh, individuals are, are colored by their race ethnicity. So we have um, black folks in, in purple and white folks in green. And you can see basically, this is just a visual representation of what was on that last slide that we have a lot of purple, so black non-Hispanic folks on the left side of our, our figure where people are using Jack and Facebook quite a bit. 
And then on the right side where we have our green folks, we have a lot of white non-Hispanic folks using Grindr and Tinder. Um, so then if we look at our one mode projection of people connected through apps, um, so here our dots are our people, and then the ties between them are um, the apps that connect them. So for instance, if there are two two people who both use Grindr, they're going to be connected through a tie. Um, this makes obviously a lot of connectivity. Um, so there are 54,000 edges between our 461 people. Uh, and most of those edges that are created are, are quite low weight. So there people are connected by either one or two apps. Um, and there are very few folks who are connected by three or more apps. Um, the assortativity coefficient ends up being fairly low, but we do think that there's some clear assortativity going on where we see um, the, the folks in purple uh, tending to cluster together, whereas the um, the other all other race ethnicities, so non-black folks, seem to cluster together um, more more significantly. Um, so a little discussion of that chunk of work. Um, there's some systematic differences by race ethnicity in the use of apps and websites to find sexual partners. Um, where folks of different race ethnicities use different um, apps. App use also creates an enormous amount of potential connect connectivity. So um, we kind of know this in intuitively, but um, there's a lot of potential for, for folks um, to, to meet on these apps. Um, there are clear differences in the racial and ethnic makeup of potential partners that are seen online by different race ethnicities. Um, and just to note that kind of online spaces reflect the real world. So racial segregation in these apps is, is similar to the experience in, in physical places. Um, another note is that multiple app use is common and some apps kind of cluster together more than you would expect strictly by frequency of use. And then finally, an important limitation is that apps have changed quite a lot in the past five or six years. So um, kind of a caveat that, that um, all of these findings are uh, due to be updated. And so we're hoping to collect more data in the next uh, few years um, that will um, update these analyses. Okay, so then shifting gears one more time before I uh, close, um, I'll talk a little bit about a project simulating sexual networks in South Africa. Um, so I'm sure that you all know this, sexual networks impact HIV transmission um, HIV in Southern Africa is largely driven by sexual transmission, and we know little of, of sexual networks in Southern Africa. Um, so the question that we set out to ask were, with limited data, can we simulate sexual networks? And then what do assumptions about the male and female reports of sexual partners tell us about network structure and transmission? Uh, so this is a work in collaboration with the Human Sciences Research Council. Um, and so this is an analysis of um, the, <clears throat> the fourth South African National HIV Prevalence Incidents and Behavior Survey, um, abbreviated for no clear reason SABSM so for. Um, and the <clears throat> SABSM data um, is basically a big uh, household-based uh, nationally representative, so it's these multi-stage cluster randomized, uh, sorry, cluster um, cluster-based surveys um, and <laughs> collects data on tons and tons and tons of indicators, um, a largely geared around uh, collecting data about HIV um, and kind of the state of the epidemic in, in South Africa. Um, so we had three sexual network data types available within this uh, survey. And specifically, these are all focused on, on heterosexual networks, uh, just due to the, the way that the data is collected, um, which is a big limitation to the analysis. Um, the first is that we have degree data. So if people are asked about their number of partners in the past year. Um, <laughs> the second thing that we have are our household partner questionnaires that are linked. So if, um, for instance, they sample my household, um, the, the, interviewer gets information from me 
and my husband, and then they can fully link the questionnaires that are between those two household partners. Um, then <laughs> egocentric partnership history is also collected. So you know about um, up to three most recent sexual partners. There's more limited data in the that egocentric partnership history, right? So it's going to be um, whatever is reported by the uh, within the the subset of questions, but not going to be as comprehensive as that that household partner questionnaire linkage, but does give us some information about um, non household partners as well. Um, so basically, the the what we're doing is simulating these sexual networks consistent with observed data. Um, so what we're observing is obviously not our goal. Um, we have the these household partner and egocentric partnership data. And what we really would like to have is the, the complete network data, the data on top. Um, so our goal is to identify those networks that match our observed data. Um, what we use are degree distributions stratified by age um, and specifically looking at casual versus regular partnerships. And then we look at um, some mixing patterns. So um, how similar are folks by, by age? race, education, and employment. Um, and there are too many networks to directly find the maximum likelihood network. So a 1,000 person bipartite network. So because this is purely heterosexual data, this is a bipartite network. We'll have around two to the 500, 10 to 500 possible networks, right? So that's a huge number. Um, so we have to use um, Markov Chain Monte Carlo to be able to uh, simulate these sexual networks. And so what we do is our, we generate our population, um, randomly distribute partnerships, and we call this our current network. Uh, we calculate the likelihood of our data having arisen from our current network. So we have our network distribution from this current network and we have our data and we compare those uh, degree age difference matching and, and the characteristics of the individuals. Um, and then we randomly permute. So we're going to permute the the partnership. So where those ties are between people, or we're also going to um, change, leave the leave the ties together, but change the characteristics of the individuals. Do the same thing, calculating the likelihood from now our proposed network, and then we compare that likelihood um, to a random uniform number. We accept if it's uh, if it's greater than that. Um, uniform num random uniform number, and uh, if not, we reject that proposed network and keep our current network. Reiterate that bunch, a bunch, a bunch, a bunch, a bunch of times, and then sample from our networks following the burn-in period. One of the questions that we had to address is that um, men report more uh, sexual partnerships than women do in in South Africa in this survey, in particular, but pretty much across the board. Um, you can see that this is the degree distribution. We have more women in these these red dots who report um, zero or one partners than we have, and, and a lot more men reporting two or more partners than women do. On average, this comes out to 0.37 more partners per woman based on a, a weighted uh, the weighted within the national population. So we use three methods to deal with that. Um, the first is what we're calling true reporting. So where we just shove the data in with kind of agnostically and let the algorithm find the balance between what women report and what men report. Um, the next is where the next two, we basically assume that what men report is accurate, which obviously has issues that we just kind of for demonstration for, for kind of theoretical purposes more. Um, so we're assuming that men's reports are accurate and that women are systematically under-reporting uh, their partnerships. Um, and then the next is um, that we, men are accurately reporting, but that all of the extra partners that men are, are reporting are in some hidden female sex worker population that we're not capturing um, in, our, in our population based survey. So I'll go through um, some of the characteristics of the networks that we get out from those three approaches and just show how different they can be um, while being kind of internally consistent within the approach that, that there's 
really substantial differences between between the networks that we get out. And the, these are 1,000 person networks. So um, just as a note. So we can see that the number of components quite a bit higher for the those underreporting networks than for the true reporting or the FSW networks. Um, the proportion of our components that are greater than size five um, is higher for both the true reporting and underreporting than it is for the FSW networks. But what you're not seeing in those first two plots is that the size of the largest component in these FSW networks, while there are less components and there are uh, less large components, that there is one really large component when you when you include FSWs in, in your network. Um, we also have a much higher average path length, and that's really due to there just being a much larger component to have long paths through and higher average between this as well. Um, and so next, so we found that that these uh, differences make a difference in terms of the network structure, but does that matter in terms of disease transmission? That was the question we sought to answer next. So given that these are just static networks that we're simulating, um, we wanted to just look at the first generation of, of transmission uh, on our simulated networks and say, are there differences between our, our three strategies? So we infect between one and 500 individuals and within our 1,000 person network. And then we run for one time step. So we say, how many people get infected in that, in that one time step? And the probability of infection is distributed based on SAPSM4 and published FSW data. Um, and we initialize each network 10 times um, to be able to account for some uncertainty there. And we do see pretty clear um, separation, even just in that first, first generation time, based on the, the three assumptions that we're making about network structure, um, where we have our true reporting, which has the least partnerships and makes sense that it would have the least number of, of um, onward transmissions in that first, uh, first step. <laughs> then we have our, our under-reporting approach coming in next. And our FSW really consistently um, increased <clears throat> number of, of infections within even just that first generation. So there are lots of limitations to that that kind of theoretical approach to looking at this question. Um, one is that we treat all of our path to your partnerships as concurrent partnerships, uh, only looking at static networks. Um, we only assess networks of the same size. And then the female sex worker simulations don't take into account that there's potentially different behaviors with, with female sex worker partners than there would be potentially with other types of partners. Um, and some conclusions. Uh, are that we simulate networks that are consistent within uh, a simulation uh, method, but that alternative options to balance those male and female partnership reports leads to highly varying network structures. Next is that just including female sex workers in networks connect many individuals into a single large component and that the large components are more conducive to more rapid HIV spread to more people. Um, so for networks with set workers, which is obviously basically all networks around the world <laughs> and other individuals uh, with a really high number of sex partners, uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis and combination prevention interventions are vital. So I'm back to my outline. <laughs> I've gone through all of these varying topics. Um, I hope that what I've convinced you about is that that networks are important and given you some tools to think about networks and, and network terminology, um, as well as hopefully um, a demonstration of kind of two little bits of work that really use networks in a, in a, in a pivotal way. Um, so this is obviously the work of a whole lot of folks. So here are all of my acknowledgements here. Um, and thank you to you all for, for um, uh, <laughs> bearing with me and, and listening to the talk. So I'm happy to take any questions, I think, Hopefully there are about 10 minutes left, great. So I encourage folks uh, to either unmute themselves and ask questions directly, or feel free to type into the chat and then uh, I can read those out loud. 
Um, in the meantime, Katie, thank you for this great talk. And uh, I'm a little overwhelmed by, you know, all the things going on. Uh, so I'll ask a very kind of high level, simple question, which is, my impression was that you feel encouraged that the simulations that you're able to build are reasonably representative, right, of of what you think is truly going on. And uh, assuming that that's true, I would also guess that at the end of the day, especially in terms of HIV, you want to somehow find ways to promote prevention. And I would imagine at some point, I'd like you to help me connect the dots. Like I'm thinking you've studied how networks can kind of accurately capture transmission of HIV, and you've come up with ways that reasonably simulate that, I would imagine a next step is to, to examine using your simulations, how well certain interventional approaches work. And, yeah, and yeah. maybe tie that together, like some, some interventions that have been planned, you know, to, to prevent uh, the spread of HIV, and how you've been able to use your network simulations to test those and refine those. Yeah, for sure. So I think that um, this is much more kind of at the stage of being more theoretical work and, and not really to the point of being so realistic that I would feel confident that that if I were to simulate an intervention on it, that I would say, oh, yes, of course, I have sure. everything correct. But that being said, I think that you can certainly um, generate these networks and, and folks, I mean, I'm building on like a body, a huge body of, of modeling work that has, has looked at questions like this. So um, you could certainly look at, at targeting specific folks on that network and looking at your strategies and saying how, how in you, in your, that first time step, for instance, how many infections are you getting if we decrease infectivity in, in X number of individuals by X percentage. And, and that's really what, what the mathematical models, generally speaking, do where, where you say, you know, if I'm going to provide combination HIV prevention to, to 30% of sex workers, or if I'm going to do it to 80% of sex workers, that what would, what would that kind of next impact be on, on HIV transmission? Um, and I mean, I think that we also come into bumps on, in the road along kind of identifying those folks. And there's also tons, tons of work on, on how to do that. Um, but, but it's all, um, yeah, like very much st several steps removed, but, but kind of with that, that idea in mind. Okay. Um... Let's see, I'm looking on chat and I'm not seeing anything yes yet. So uh, another observation I had, and, and please push back if this is off, is it seemed like the female sex workers being involved in the network are obviously this kind of fulcrum, this high risk point. I wondered in, in terms of policy, have studies shown in countries where female sex work is legal and therefore maybe better regulated are the dynamics different or, or do, do they or do they tend to hold up regardless of different cultures and, and different uh, legal regulatory policy type context yeah um I'm not sure they have a good answer for you I like off the top of my head, I can't think of a, a an analysis that would look like that. Um, I I'm sure that they have. Um, I would assume that legalization and like makes a huge difference, and and that very much the the kind of context matters. Um, but I don't know of any um, specific examples, and this might be. Um, yeah, just showing my um, 
naivete to kind of a full global <laughs> approach to thinking about this question. Great. Um, you you mentioned early in your talk that some of this uh, early network theory was developed uh, regarding the spread of respiratory diseases. And, uh, you know, given our pandemic recently, I wondered, uh, has this network theory, has it, has it been applied widely during the pandemic? Yeah, yeah. So there's been um, lots of, of modeling of disease transmission within the pandemic and a lot of it has for instance used the the polymod data for thinking about how how contact patterns uh, kind of were pre-pandemic and then thinking about how that changed um during the pandemic and because because when lockdowns happen the, the, those contact patterns outside of the home don't happen anymore or happen at a at a more limited in a little more limited way um yeah so there's been there's been quite a bit of um kind of a flood, I would say, <laughs> of social network uh, analyses that are relevant for COVID that, that have happened. So um yeah, I think um it's been it's been really interesting to see the kind of steady stream of of different different research looking at looking at networks within within social network context in, in COVID times. Um, so I'll ask you one last question, and I, I do this because people are shy on chat today. Um, yes. Where do you see this uh, going in the future, Katie? Where where do you see areas of growth and future research happening with the network structures and network analysis? Um, I think there, um, I mean, certainly within HIV, I think there's a move to um, include networks realistically within within mathematical models and and the, I mean has been a shift that's been going over a while now. Um, uh, there's kind of a lot of space for um, uh, thinking about thinking about that and and because this data is so hard to collect, um, I think that there are some interesting questions around kind of novel data collection tools and um different different ways to to kind of capture the data that that's hard to capture otherwise um what else did i think um yeah i mean it's, it's i think it's a i think it's an exciting area and i'm excited to see where folks, folks take it um but i don't yeah i don't know that i have a general um I, I was thinking exactly. how, you know, when uh, I, I seem to always be explaining on statistical consultations about missing at random and missing not at random. And, and this population where people are actually talking about the most intimate things possible, uh, you would have to think that missing data is missing not at random because it's the reason it's missing is has to do with the nature of the information, the actual values themselves, much like very wealthy people will not report their income because they are so wealthy and the same for very poor people, right? Yeah, hmm. yeah exactly. I mean, I think it's, yeah, there's <laughs> all kinds of limitations to the data, but um, yeah. So while there, I think while there are certainly cases where um, the data is not as high quality as it could be. I think that I think we can still glean kind of interesting observations from from what we can what we can get. Well, it's it's very very important work. Uh, it it certainly helps people in all cultures in in all socioeconomic strata. And I thank you for this very informative lecture. And since we're at the top of the hour, uh, I think we'll let folks go, but I encourage you. Oh, we have uh, Dari Lin. Do you wanna unmute yourself? Oh, you're clapping, okay. So several people are clapping and uh, I echo that. And I thank you so much, Katie, for sharing this important work for us and wish you all the best as you continue this courageous work. Awesome. Thank you all for, for joining today. I really appreciate it.
And remember, folks, you will be getting a an email with the slides, with the link to the recording, and then you feel free to email Katie if you have further questions about this or if you foresee future possibilities of collaboration in, in this interesting and growing area. Thanks again, Katie. Thank you, Gary. I'm going to stop the recording now. Okay. Okay, great.